Well, good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to DAV's service and legislative seminar. I'm Jim Marzak, DAV's National Service Director, and I'm joined by Joy Elam, DAV's National Legislative Director, as co-host for today's seminar. As we have done for the past several years, we'll be having a candid conversation with senior leaders at the Department of Veterans Affairs about some of the most critical challenges and policies affecting veterans, including burn pits and toxic, toxic exposures, VA health care and benefits, family caregiver support, suicide prevention, survivor benefits, and many other topics. But before we begin, we want to introduce our special guest. I'm pleased to introduce the Honorable Matthew T. Quinn, Under Secretary for Memorial Affairs. In this position, he has responsibility for 155 VA national cemeteries and 120 VA grant-funded state and tribal veteran cemeteries that provide dignified burials for veterans and eligible family members. He is a retired Major General, having served nearly 37 years in the Army and Army National Guard, culminating in his selection as a 27th Adjutant General for the state of Montana. His service included commanding the A Company 34th Signal Battalion in Operation Desert Storm in 1991 and the 495th Transportation Battalion in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He is a recipient of numerous military <coughs> awards, including the Distinguished Service Medal, the Bronze Star with one Bronze Oak Leaf Cluster, and the Meritorious Service Medal with three Bronze Oak Leaf Clusters. Under Secretary Quinn earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Montana State University, a master in business administration from the University of Montana, and a master of strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College. Please join me in a warm welcome for Under Secretary Matt Quinn. Thank you. We also are pleased to have with us today Dr. Sharif El Nahal, VA's new Under Secretary for Health who was sworn in just a couple of weeks ago after having been nominated by President Biden and confirmed by the United States Senate. Dr. El Nahal is a physician leader who has a range of experience working in both the public and private sector, including two stints at VA. Most recently, he served as President and Chief Executive Officer of University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. He previously served as New Jersey's 21st Health Commissioner. Dr. El Nahal's federal service includes two years as Assistant Deputy Undersecretary for Health, Quality, Safety, and Value, and a year as a White House Fellow in the VA. During that time, he co-founded the VHA Innovation Ecosystem, a program that continues to foster the spread of innovation and best practices to improve veteran care across the nation. Dr. El Nahal has an, holds an MD from Harvard Medical School and an MBA with distinction from Harvard Business School. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to new VA Undersecretary for Health, Dr. Sharif El Nahal. Very pleased that we are joined by the acting head of VBA, Joshua Jacobs, who also assumed his position within the last two weeks. Josh Jacobs serves as a senior advisor for policy performing the delegable duties of the Undersecretary for Benefits. In this role, he leads more than 25,000 VBA employees and 56 regional offices to deliver nearly $135 billion in VA benefits to almost 6 million veterans and their survivors. Josh previously served two stints as a senior advisor in the Office of the Secretary, most recently focused on the designing and implementing new structure and processes for enterprise governance and policy development. In 2016, he was awarded the Secretary's Mer Meritorious Service Award. Prior to joining VA in 2021, Josh was a senior associate at Booz Allen Hamilton. Josh also served nine years in the U.S. Senate, including two years as a deputy staff director for the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, where he often worked closely with Joy and other members of our legislative team to develop, enact, and oversee legislation to strengthen v veterans' health care and benefit programs. Please join me in warming a war warm welcome to the new acting head of VBA, but an old friend of DAV, Josh Jacobs. <laughs> Before we get to questions, we wanted to give each of our guests the opportunity to share some opening thoughts, what is happening in their respective administrations, and their plans for the future. 
Let's begin with the most senior member of our distinguished trio, NCA's Undersecretary, Matt Quinn. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, what was left off of the bio is lifetime member of DAV. I want to make sure. Uh, Listen, I, I've been on the position uh, just over a year. Uh, came into this, as was mentioned, from the Montana National Guard, really not knowing uh, the mission of National Cemetery Administration, not knowing the, the breadth of what uh, the teammates that I have the honor to, to, to serve with do. But they are committed to the veterans so that we honor the service of our veterans, but likewise, committed to the family members as we recognize the sacrifice that those family members gave. I like to tell our teammates within NCA, we are that final benefit. We have that final opportunity to thank that veteran for their service and to thank that family member for that veteran service. That's the last time we as a nation will be able to provide the true honors that that veteran deserves for her or his service. So it's so critically important that we work with you all to make sure that our team members know that mission, what we can do better, and how we can better support you all. We have a great goal within NCA. 95% of veterans should have a national or a state tribal territorial grant cemetery within 75 miles. That's our mission, that's our goal. We are right now at about 93.7%, and I think probably some of the questions will hit on this. But we need your all support in ensuring veterans know that this is a benefit that they have received to their service, and that family members know that when it's time to provide that final honor to the veteran, that they should at least consider the National Cemetery Administration. So thanks for joining us here today. Super proud to be with you, and thanks for your all service and your all sacrifice. Thank you. Next, some opening comments from Dr. El Nahal. Thank you so much, Joy, and I want to thank Commander Marshall and DAV leadership for the gracious invitation. Um, and I want to thank all of you, most importantly, for the daily work you do for your colleagues, veterans, people who've served this country honorably. And the way I view my job in this role is to do the work for them in every way that I can. I have not served myself, under, unlike under Secretary Quinn, but let me just go through a couple things in my life and my history that brought me close to people who've served this country and to veterans. Among my first clinical experiences in medical school was in the West Roxbury VA. In fact, it was, I think, my first emergency room rotation. And I met a veteran from Connecticut who drove over an hour with crushing chest pain just to get to that emergency room. And so, of course, after we stabilized him, we knew he was having a heart attack. He knew he was having a heart attack. We asked him, you know, why did you drive all this way here instead of going to that emergency room five minutes away from where you live? And he said, I would not trust my care with anybody else. This is my hospital. There are veterans like me here. And these are the folks who know what I need every single day. And so I knew that I would try to work for organizations for the rest of my life that did that for people and had a mission that was that important. Fast forward through my education. The 2014 access crisis happened, and I decided to try to raise my hand and volunteer what I knew in medicine and what I knew uh, in access to health care to try and help. And so I applied to the White House Fellowship, joined the VA team, and spent what I didn't know ultimately would be almost three years working my hardest to serve the folks at medical centers, clinics across the country, serving veterans every day. I learned, in other words, how to be a leader in VA, right after my medical training. That was my most formative experience in learning what I could do for people at that level. Fast forward even more to my experience running a level one trauma center in Newark, New Jersey. Served a town of 300,000 people, including EMS services. And then a global pandemic happened 
less than six months after I started at that hospital. We were struggling. Our staff was out due to COVID themselves. Almost every bed in my hospital was filled with somebody with this deadly disease. And at that time, we were desperate for help. And then who and other than the US Army reservists, a group of folks from across the country came to my hospital side by side with my clinicians, integrated with our team to serve our patients. They not only came once, but they came twice in the most recent Omicron surge this past January, this time active duty Army clinicians. And so of course I always had an appreciation for what folks who wear the uniform do for us, but no longer was that appreciation abstract or theoretical. I was seeing these heroes side by side with us, dealing again with the worst public health crisis we had ever seen. And so my appreciation isn't just because you all sacrificed for us, it's personal. When the president nominated me for this position, that was my way of helping to pay back folks that I knew came to my need when our community needed it. And I got to appreciate what folks like you have done across the entire world to keep us safe. I couldn't be more honored to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. Opening comments from VBA's acting undersecretary. Great, thanks very much, uh, Jim. Thank you, Joy. And Thank you, everyone, for the, the warm welcome. Uh, I have to say, uh, having uh, sat and listened uh, to this morning's session, I feel incredibly energized. The, the scope and the breadth of the services and the support that you provide to veterans and families is, is really tremendous, and it's also a reminder of the obligation that each of us has, along with our colleagues, to deliver on the promises of a grateful nation. I know that we haven't always lived up to that promise, but I know that there is a commitment and a will uh, to do so, and I know together we can do that successfully. I know that each and every one of you, as well as your colleagues and friends who aren't here with us today, do tremendous work uh, day in and day out supporting the veterans, families, caregivers, and survivors who've contributed uh, to the greatness of this nation. And I know that your team in DC, Jim, Joy, Randy, have done an incredible job leading the charge to make improvements to the policies and the support and the funding that we need to do our job on behalf of each and every one of you. And it, it's with that collective effort that we are on Wednesday going to be able to go celebrate the passage and the implementation with the signature of the President for the PACT Act. So I want to say a big thanks to each and every one of you for doing that. Now, the hard part we may, uh, we may all uh, realize, is not what it took to get to this point. And that was hard. The hard part's going to be in actually implementing the bill and delivering on that promise. And I know that we need to work hand in hand with each of you uh, to provide transparent communications about what we're doing, to work collaboratively when we're off track. And I know Randy, Jim, Joy, I've known Joy since 2007. Mm -hmm. I know she doesn't mince words, she doesn't hold back, and she tells us when we're doing something right, and, she, and I know each and every one of you will tell us when we're not doing what we need to be doing. I can promise you we are going to do our best. We're gonna step up to the, uh, the challenge because we're excited for the opportunity to provide uh, more access and improve outcomes for everyone this, this bill will uh, benefit. But, it's not gonna be easy, and while much of the attention that we're going to uh, face is gonna be focused on the bill, we have a whole host of other business lines that we need to deliver on, whether it's insurance, uh, our GI Bill and education programs, our home loans, and, and many other things. And so I am really looking forward, uh, two weeks in, to continuing to work with each and every one of you as we work to fulfill uh, the mission of this great nation. And so I very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. All right, so we'll get the conversation started. And we first want to talk about the continuing impact of COVID-19, the pandemic, and how it's affected every part of VA. And we'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Quinn. It's been two and a half years since the onset of, of, of the pandemic. There's certainly been many improvements and obstacles that have been overcome, but COVID still continues to impact VA in some degree. Um, what were your biggest COVID impacts that NCA had to overcome during the past couple of years? 
Are there still any COVID restrictions remaining for national cemeteries and burials? And what COVID-related issues remain for NCA going forward? Yeah, I, listen, uh, great question. So like most of the nation, uh, when COVID hit, we weren't sure uh, the impact that it was gonna have on our national cemeteries. So there was a three month period in which um, we, we weren't doing direct interment services uh, for our veterans. That bothered our crew greatly, but we had to be sure that when we brought veterans or family members to our cemeteries to do an interment, that we were doing that safely. And so we did stop direct interment services and ask families if they would like to do uh, an honor ceremony at a further date when we knew more, uh, then we would, we would open that up to them. We are starting to see the impact, uh, we believe, from COVID in terms of our internment rates. So 2021, one of the largest years for the number of internments we've done in our national cemeteries. Uh, 2022 is on pace to at least uh, meet, if not exceed, the number of internments at our national cemeteries uh, across this nation. And so we continue uh, to watch that closely. We've seen the type of internments change from uh, coffin, um, casket-based internments to more cremations as we look across. And those, there are different pockets where we're seeing uh, more cremations. In some areas, uh, two-thirds of our internments are cremations and one-third casketed. In other areas, I was up in Jacksonville yesterday, they're still about 50% casket. 50% um, uh, cremation. And so we continue to watch those trends as we look at uh, new cemeteries or as we expand existing cemeteries on how to continue to best uh, serve veterans. Uh, we did have uh, uh, two of our national cemeteries which kind of ran into a bind where services were taken longer, uh, roughly about six weeks, uh, longer than, than what we want them to take uh, we added additional staffing at those uh, two cemeteries and uh, brought in some extra services to, to some temporary committal shelters so we could get that back on track. Our goal is uh, two weeks uh, from the time a family calls. And a lot of that is dependent upon the family scheduling. When the family's looking to do it, some families may want to wait until they can gather the family together. We'll certainly take that into account. So I think. Uh, NCA is back on track where we need to be with our families and our veterans and uh, hopefully you all as you are out at our national cemeteries or at any one of the state grant cemeteries are seeing NCA back in the fold serving veterans, serving family members as you all expect and as we expect we should do. Excellent. Uh, do you guys have any plans to further reduce wait times? And one of the questions we get from our membership quite often is, would NCA consider allowing weekend burials to reduce those wait times? Is that yes. something being talked about? So we have, uh, we actually did a, a model before I came on board uh, looking at a Saturday interment. And uh, we did that for about 18 months. Uh, there was some uptake on it, but, but not a lot of demand that would justify us having, uh, so we would have to shift our workers into a, maybe Tuesday through Saturday as opposed to Monday through Friday. So as we evaluated those sites that did a Saturday internment, it, it really came back to families wanted that Monday through Friday for the most part. Uh, we will do a special occasion if, if there needs to be, if we have a, a KIA return that asks for a Saturday internment uh, for religious purposes or, or other needs, we'll adjust the schedule. But for the most part, I think what's working best for the veterans and families and if that's not true, I need to hear it. But um, it, it continues to be a Monday through Friday schedule. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. You bet. Let's turn to VA Joy. Joy? Dr. Ellen Hall, um, we know that VA sprang into action, especially on the healthcare side, as soon as COVID began. And even before we were getting um, some you know, word and, and information um, from VHA. Um, Clearly, you know, you should be commended for the way VA um, reacted, making sure that veterans, I mean, there were lots of restrictions, but keeping um, veterans informed about what they needed to do to be able to get medications, how they could be seen in mental health, um, how they could, you know, get what they needed to get vaccines when that was available. So are there any, you know, things are sort of starting to turn, return to somewhat of a normal. Um, what restrictions are remaining in VA facilities? And 
given you know the new variants that are circulating, I'm sure everyone's concerned again. You know, where where are we going with this? And then, what is the status of any backlog of medical appointments that were created? Because we know, you know, a lot of people just now are being able to go back in and kind of take care of some things they needed to do in person. Yeah, thanks, Joy. Really important questions, and um, it's really been a journey not only for VA but really for the entire American healthcare system since the pandemic started. And so always in my mind will be the balance of number one, keeping our veterans, families, caregivers, and survivors, if they're in our facilities, safe, our employees who serve them safe, but also maximizing to the extent that it's safe, the ability for you to interact with your veterans when they're in our facilities. And especially that tension comes with nursing homes and community living centers. We still do hear a lot of complaints about accessibility in certain parts of the country, knowing that a lot of these restrictions are in place that the mo among the most vulnerable veterans don't get sick with this disease. And while the variants have come and gone, it is still a very severe virus when it comes to folks, especially in nursing homes. And so that balance is never gonna be perfect, but know that we have excellent people on the infectious disease side, geriatrics and extended care, and really national experts in what they do, deciding where we go on restrictions versus not, knowing that the compassion that all of you want to see when you're in and when you have family members and loved ones in is something that we're considering every day. I will say that the overall trajectory of the pandemic is still uncertain. We don't know what's gonna happen after the dominant variant now, which is BA5. There's already a new variant that's starting to take hold. It's a subset of BA4. We're gonna see how that goes, but we're in a situation now where the vaccines that initially came out are becoming less and less effective as the virus mutates and changes. And so there are vaccines on the horizon that will help protect against this virus better and hopefully in the coming months. So we're excited to see that. We're gonna offer that to our employees and veterans across the country. I think moving forward, uh, again, we are going to make sure that every single new therapy and innovation is available to our veterans. That'll be my job to fight for stockpiles, for example, of new vaccines, new therapeutics, um, and make sure that that's available to you so that when you're advocating in your parts of the country for your veterans, you make sure they're getting what, they're need, what they need. And so that feedback to us will be extremely important. Right. What do you think the long-term um, impact will be of the, on the pandemic influencing just the future models of care? I mean, we know there was a lot of use of telehealth, which was just a godsend to be able to at least communicate face-to-face. -face. Um, but what do you, th are you seeing any trends, you know, at this point where now there's going to be this major change um, in how healthcare is delivered just across the country. Yeah, so we were doing the majority of healthcare in person. We were doing more telehealth than the private sector, for example, before the pandemic started. But we were still doing the vast majority of appointments in person. Then the pandemic started, and all of the investments VA has made in telehealth over the years kicked in. And almost every clinic appointment was done via telehealth for quite some time. And so that was an explosion in the use of that technology, which I think not only benefited our employees in being more facile with it, our doctors, our nurses, the folks who see veterans every day, but it, I think, made veterans more and more comfortable using the technology because, frankly, there was no other choice for, for a little while. Now we're in the situation where we have to figure out what the role of telehealth is versus in-person appointments. And I think the answer number one is a mix. So no one's gonna tell you that we're gonna go full bore on one and then never do the other. That's, that's the wrong move. But also to, to view telehealth as yet another tool in your doctor's and nurse's tool belts to deliver the care you need. So for most veterans, it's going to be a mix and that mix is gonna depend exactly on what that veteran is facing, the diseases that they have, the problems that they're facing, and even for mental health, where you can do a lot of appointments safely and effectively through telehealth, 
our mental health clinicians say there's often information you can get in person, one-on-one, -on -one, with that veteran that may not be as possible if you're beaming into their home with other people around, et cetera. So I think that all has to be personalized and tailored to what that veteran needs. And it's our job to design our programs and equip our frontline docs and nurses and care teams with that technology. And so I think you're gonna see a leveling off of telehealth, much more than we were doing before the pandemic, but uh, still less than the peak of the pandemic when in-person appointments weren't as available. One last uh, question on that. Um, you know, early on there were a lot of challenges with, for everyone, you know, supply chain issues, which still linger, linger on. But what were the lessons learned for VHA, you know, um, you know fear, again, of a, di of a different thing where, you know, is VA going to do something specific with regard to that, making sure that they have the supplies that they need directly without having to rely on, you know, things coming from across the world? So our, uh, again, frontline folks who are seeing veterans in very, very desperate situations during the pandemic, uh, that situation came close to not having what the PPE that they needed to safely do their jobs. Based on all of the problems with the supply chain that were happening globally, but for the most part, VA kept up way better than the civilian sector in terms of healthcare uh, in getting the supplies they needed to the field and to medical centers and clinics. What I can tell you is that since the, begin the pandemic began, a lot of new programming was put in place to reduce that risk going forward. Number one, the stockpiles of PPE in every hospital and clinic. There's now 90 to 120 days worth of anything someone might need to serve a veteran safely. That did not exist before. We were in this quote unquote just in time system for these critical medical supplies, no longer. So that's one piece of reassurance. The second is the development of these things called regional readiness centers, where we actually have backup stockpiles of PPE that can be used by our employees and veterans in strategic locations across the country. So that if this or that ended up being close to running out, we can deliver those supplies safely and effectively to those hospitals. I think this is being done, and this is before I got here, by the way, so it's not a pat on my own back, better in VA than almost anywhere else. That said, you can never uh, be too um, lax about this because you don't know what that next medical supply is. There was a chance that we would run out of liquid oxygen at certain points, testing supplies, really critical things. So we're always thinking about this. Our supply chain folks are constantly working to make sure that that does not happen. Thank you, great news. Jim, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Joy. This question is for Acting Under Secretary Jacobs. VBA was also significantly impacted during the COVID pandemic, and particularly by the need to maintain social distancing early on that disrupted the ability of veterans to receive disability compensation exams. In addition, the disruption to operations at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis significantly delayed VA's ability to develop claims and thus extended wait times for veterans. Has VBA overcome these and other COVID-related challenges, and what actions are being taken or need to be taken to overcome continuing disruptions and impacts from the pandemic? Yeah, I think uh, VBA, like uh, our partners in VHA and NCA, were uh, significantly impacted by the pandemic. Uh, you mentioned the Nas National Personnel Record Center. Uh, they, they effectively had to, to shut down for some time. They were in, uh, unable to obtain the records that we need to use as, as part of the claims process. What we were able to do with the help of VHA was to vaccinate a number of those employees, and we also put our VBA staff on the ground to help get records uh, moved out. So whether we needed it for a claim uh, or for a burial, we were able to help uh, do that. We've also been working to scan uh, a lot of those records so we don't have the same reliance on the paper-based system so that as we look to a potential future scenarios, uh, we have a, a backup plan that uh, in increases the optimization of the process. I would say uh, the, the other major impact was the uh, medical examination process. And, and certainly uh, when we're trying to social distance and maintain uh, safety, it uh, doesn't feel right to send a veteran to, to go get a physical exam if it's not critical. And so uh, in some cases we were able to uh, eliminate the need for that by finding evidence um, that existed in the file. In other cases we just delayed 
of the decision. And so what we've been having to do is work through those claims. I would say uh, we recently hit a milestone. Uh, our backlog uh, went below 170,000 for the first time in two years, which is, which is a big deal. Uh, and it's thanks to a lot of hard work, but it's still too high. And so what we're doing is, is really a workload management issue. It's trying to balance the need for getting the, the oldest claims first while also managing uh, to tackle those that are ready so we can get, uh, we can optimize the speed at which uh, a veteran uh, can get their uh, high quality claim. So prior to the pandemic, VBA, uh, uh, a good portion of the workforce did telework mm -hmm. prior to the pandemic. What lessons did VBA learn during the pandemic about remote work the past two and a half years? And what do you foresee uh, as the future balance of remote and in-person work for VBA? Yeah, I would say with a uh, big thanks to Tom Murphy, who is my predecessor and is now a, uh, is, is back in his full-time job as the, um, as, as a district director for the uh, Northeastern section, um, we were able to navigate quite well. And I think the major lesson that we learned is we can do a good job in a remote posture. Um, and so we were able to kind of manage notwithstanding the challenges that I just mentioned. And, and I think that the major lesson for us as we look forward is there has to be a right balance. And so right now we are bringing people back to the office as part of the broader OPM policy that requires staff to be in the office two days per pay period. But we're trying to navigate uh, a balance of, of meeting employees where they are. Some want to be back full time. Some don't want to come back to the office at all. And, and really what we need to do is to, to look at the numbers to understand what are our production numbers, what are our quality numbers, and then what does that do to the culture? And I think we're still working that out. Uh, we're working through a couple of a virtual regional office pilots where we're going to be testing uh, fully virtual uh, capabilities in very focused areas. Um, and so I think as we're moving forward, we're going to take an evidence-based approach to assess how we might explore kind of optimizing more virtual work, but all the while maintaining a, a public-facing presence because we need to have people, boots on the ground, who can engage with veterans who want to come in, who need help. We also know uh, that DAV and our other VSO partners are, are on the ground uh, in our regional office buildings, and we want to make sure that there are people there as well. And so we're still working through uh, all of this, like much of the, the rest of the world. Um, and so I would say there's more to come. I mean, that's great news to hear that all of your public contact offices are open and yep. operational full, five days a week, Monday through Friday, correct? That's my understanding. Yep. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Yep. Joy. So Dr. Al Nahal, before I ask some tough questions about VHA vacancies, um, I think I could speak for our membership here that we all really appreciate all of the, um, for the, all the clinical staff in VHA, how hard they worked, the stress that they were under during the pandemic for the last several years. Um, many of them, you know, really coming, um, putting veterans first before their families in some cases, and at great risk, at great risk their personal health. So we do, we do really appreciate that. But we know that there were staffing shortages, you know, even before the the uh, pandemic, and we can only imagine the the pressure on staff, um, you know, to retire, perhaps to leave, and we we um, worrying about these vacancies. Can you talk about? how um, VHA's workforce has been impacted by that, what you um, are doing to recruit, retain, and you know, attract new um, high qualified you know, uh, clinical people to work at VHA. So if there's an issue that keeps me up at night the most on week two, um, it's this one. I, uh, part of my job is to come to these conventions and be totally honest and as transparent as I can be about these issues. That said, uh, the entire American healthcare system is facing worker shortages now. And my job is to make that problem less and less impacting the care that our veterans get every day. I will say that our staff know better than anybody else, the folks in the field, the medical centers, the clinics, the vet centers, know that we have the best patients in the world. And they did not leave at rates that other healthcare workers left in different parts of the healthcare system because they know that, especially during the worst parts of the pandemic toward the beginning. People got tired, though, 
I mean, this was something that required VA and hospitals across the country to make people work multiple shifts in a row, uh, dealing with a virus that we didn't know at, that much about, putting their own selves and lives at risk. And so because of those dynamics, there's a lot of folks who are near retirement, even mid-career, who decided to say, listen, you know, the worst part of this is over, I have to retire. So that's one dynamic that we're seeing. And in fact, these are the folks with the most experience and are onboarding new nurses, clinicians every day. To lose them at the rates that we did was really tough. On top of that, with all of dyna the dynamics of the economy, uh, the pressures on pay went up through the roof. For VA to be competitive, to be able to pay these extremely talented, hardworking people, competitive rates compared to our colleagues in the private sector, that got harder and harder. And so the Secretary took note of this and worked with all of you, worked with BSOs, worked with his partners in Congress to pass the RAISE Act, which helped bump wages up significantly for clinicians across the field. So that has helped. In addition to that, with the passage of the PACT Act, that is giving us even more authorities to be able to bring on staff of all different kinds, not just clinicians, but environmental service workers, folks who keep hospitals and clinics moving, extremely important folks that make sure at the end of the day the veteran gets what they need. We will have even more tools in our tool belt to be able to do that better. There's a lot of really great things in the PACT Act uh, that aren't as public, but will help the gears of VA work better and better, and that's one of them. What I pledge to do is make sure that VA, and by the way, uh, our amazing staff across the, the country are already trying to do this. It's my job to make it even easier and amplify those efforts. It needs to be at every recruiting event in the country for healthcare. It needs to be in front of every professional society in the country that has anything to do with hospitals, clinics, and healthcare, and mental health. We have to be there and prove to folks that we are a great place to work. And even more importantly, we have to focus on retaining the incredible people we already have. So that has everything to do with managing this concept called burnout. Again, folks getting tired, folks getting stressed in the field throughout the pandemic. And we do that not only by providing spaces and time for people to be whole, which is what we encourage all of our employees to do. Spend time with your loved ones. Do the things that make you human. Make sure that when you're not at work, you're doing everything you need to do to refresh yourself so that you can give it all for the, your veterans when you come back. But what can I do from my perch and what can every leader do in VA to break down the barriers for them to be able to do their job faster and better? Just one example. Our schedulers right now, when they're at the network level, with a bunch of hospitals, have to have four or five different scheduling grids up on the same computer screen to be able to navigate uh, the same question that a veteran calls and asks. When can I get the soonest appointment for mental health or a GI appointment or whatever it might be? The number of clicks they have to do, the number of steps they have to take to do something so simple, unless I'm actually understanding what that experience is like and unless I am obsessed with how long it's taking for them to do the right thing by our veterans, the longer it will take to solve these problems. And so that's how I've approached leadership my whole career. Go to the front line, understand what these folks need to do to serve vets better, and then rework everything we can and fix the systems around them to do that better. And that's gonna be my pledge to all of you. Thank you. Well, I think um, our members will definitely appreciate that. And one of the internal things we constantly hear is also about the HR issues that, you know, people that want to serve um, come into VA and work for VA, you know, that there's still this big lag time and, you know, they can't wait for all the, you know, um, lag time that occurs through HR. So hopefully you'll be working on HR issues as well to kind of clear the path for those folks that you're trying to um, bring into VA. We'll turn now to what's become one of the biggest issues for veterans, VA and Congress, no, no doubt, uh, burn pit toxic exposures and the PACT Act. So Jim, um, I think you're gonna start with some questions for VBA. Yep, thanks, Joy. What a week for uh, the passage. <laughs> Huge win for yeah. veterans, their families and survivors, so that's good. 
uh, with the president signs it into law, hopefully on Wednesday, mm -hmm. all the responsibility shifts from Congress now to VA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to really hear from VBA on how you've been preparing, uh, how, do you, how do you think you're going to be able to implement the, the PACT Act, whether you will need additional funding, resources, staffing, legal authorities uh, in order to manage a new workload while continuing to reduce the backlog. Yeah, we just talked about yeah. the backlog, and now you're going to have this huge influx yeah. of new claims. Yeah, so. uh, it, it's a great, great question, um, and it's one we've been working on for, for some time. So uh, when the, the president came into office, Secretary McDonough came into office, there was a very concerted effort to more proactively, intentionally, and collaboratively tackle issues related to uh, toxic exposures. And so part of the way that we did that, it was by elevating this, you mentioned my work on the governance structure. So being intentional about bringing the whole of VA, putting forward questions, and then driving implementation and holding people accountable we work to expand the type of research that we consider as we, uh, as we explore issues related to exposures. And we also uh, came out with 12 new presumptive service connections, so asthma, rhinitis, sinusitis, as well as nine rare respiratory cancers. So there's been a lot of work uh, improving the collaboration between the folks uh, who are experts in the claims process in VBA and uh, the experts on military environmental exposures uh, that uh, work in VHA with Dr. Elna Hall. I would say, with respect to the PACT Act specifically, there has been a lot of internal planning going on. You know, the organization, you know, VA is you know, 400,000 plus people. It's, it's a big ship to turn. It takes a lot. And so we've been working very intentionally to close the gaps and break down the silos so that we understand as we project the, t the number of claims, the types of claims we're going to get, what that means uh, for VHA and working to try to get that as uh, granular as possible so that he can plan for and resource appropriately the medical centers that are going to realize an increased utilization or new enrollments. Um, we, in VBA specifically, we've been working on a whole series of people, process, and technology uh, efforts. So uh, we've been working to hire 2,000 plus new claims processors uh, to tackle the new, uh, the expected increased inventory, and we're working to hire more. The challenge with that, of course, is that many of the hires that we make are internal promotions. So we have people working in our contact centers, and then they uh, interview and get hired to be a, a VSR. So that creates a different opening that we then need to fill. Um, but we're working to do both that as well as the important training. So our staff need to understand what the, the new requirements are so that they can do the right work uh, and we don't have to, to redo it. On the, uh, on the process uh, piece, we're looking at ways that we can optimize um, the process. So looking at you know, uh, unnecessary additional evidence gathering and ways to cut down the amount of time that it takes uh, for the evidence uh, portion, uh, the evidence cycle, or for you know, ready for rating uh, cycles. Uh, we've got a whole team working through all of that. And then uh, our own Rob Reynolds is doing really incredible work on automation. So looking as we now have, I think, 20 conditions that have gone through development and we're working to, to rate those claims through a new automated process that still preserves uh, a person reviewing and making the ultimate decision, but really optimizing the technology and the data that we have to drive a much more efficient process that brings about benefits more quickly for the veteran. And then finally, what I would add is uh, communication. This is a very big bill with a lot of different parts to it. And as written, it includes different implementation timelines. So we talked about the different implementation timelines on VHA for eligibility. There are also different implementation timelines uh, for the various conditions that will soon become uh, presumptively service connected. And so working to communicate what all that means to reduce the confusion and also to preemptively uh, understand that there are going to be predatory actors out there who don't have the same uh, uh, altruistic approach that DAV does to do what's right for the veteran, uh, the family member, and the survivor, but view this as a paycheck. And so trying to make sure that we're partnering with DAV, we're partnering with the states, we're partnering with other VSOs and finding those people who aren't affiliated so that they know how to go about getting that information. We have a website, 
va.gov slash pact, where we have a lot of the information and questions uh, available for anyone who wants to know. We also are going to be pushing people to go to 1-800-MY-VA-411. And so I think it's going to be incumbent upon all of us as we move forward to be very diligent, very disciplined about pushing out a proactive message, finding veterans and family members where they are, and making sure that they know we want them to apply for benefits, we want them to come in for health care, and to let them know how to do that. The, the communication piece you talked about, it's great news to hear for us and our members. I mean, I think for those that have previous denied claims for some of these issues, mm -hmm. things like that, the more information that can be provided to them, the better. I also appreciate you mentioning the predatory claims companies. Um, I'm sure a lot of our members have seen commercials and, and getting emails about Camp Lejeune uh, toxic water, and you have to be very, very careful when you get those and make sure you're talking to your advocate, your DAV NSO, to make sure that's the best route for you to take versus filing a claim at VA because any benefits you get from those, you're going to be responsible to pay those back if you're getting VA benefits as well. So you have to be very careful in those scenarios. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, I know you've been very involved in VA's work to develop its own internal model and decision-making process for adding new presumptive mm -hmm. conditions as well uh, related to burn pit and toxic yep. exposures. Can you provide an update on the model and talk about what impact the enactment of the PACT Act will have on it? Yeah, uh, well, thank you. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing since coming in in February of, uh, January of 2021 is working to develop a new approach to evaluating and considering uh, when and how to establish new presumptive service connected uh, disabilities. I think it's been fraught. Uh, it's been a challenge uh, over, over many, many years. And so we're working to try to lower the threshold uh, by which we have to establish evidence necessary to make that connection. We have developed a, a model that is, was used to help uh, drive the decisions for some of the earlier uh, presumptive service connections I mentioned. Um, and it's being evaluated at the moment by the Office of Science, uh, Science and Technology Policy within the White House. But as part of the PACT Act, uh, there is a requirement that we have this new approach reviewed and validated by NASA, the National Association of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, and so by law, we will, once the bill is signed, we will have to work with them to uh, evaluate whether uh, the model that we have developed is, is sufficient. Um, before that point, though, we're going to have to work to collaborate with DAV, with other VSOs, to make sure that you understand the approach, we get the feedback, and that we make adjustments uh, where and when appropriate. Uh, one of the benefits of the PACT Act uh, is, among many other things, is we had a, a number of conditions we were proactively working on. So constrictive bronchiolitis, working on lung cancers, on brain cancers. We were working to try to drive those through the process. Well, those are gonna be part of the PACT Act. So what's gonna happen next as part of this new model is we're gonna need to develop a list of conditions that we need to run through it. So we're gonna have to work through the substance of what the model is and how it makes decisions. And then we're gonna to need to develop the list of conditions that we then run through that model. And there's a requirement within the law that we need to push that through the federal register. We need to publish it, we need to solicit public comment. And so we'll be coming back uh, as part of that process and having the conversation with, with you, with Randy, with others, uh, to make sure that we're looking at the right conditions and, and explaining the logic for why we are or are not looking at those conditions. Well, we're excited about the collaboration for sure, so thank you. Uh, turning to the health care provisions of the PACT Act, I know Joy has a few questions for VHA. Yep, Dr. Eleanor Hall, back to you. Um, the PACT Act will expand health care eligibility over the coming years for millions of veterans exposed to burn pits and other toxic substances, including Agent Orange. Could you talk a little bit about how VHA is preparing to deliver that care uh, to newly eligible veterans? And do you think this is gonna really be a big impact on you know, staffing? Are you gonna need additional resources to, to meet the needs of these veterans? So uh, I'll start, uh, Joy, by just expressing how much of a privilege it is to be entering the organization uh, right when the biggest expansion of veterans' benefits is gonna take place in a generation. That in and of itself is such an incredible thing. Um, and so, you know, it's gonna be my job in concert with my colleagues on stage 
to implement that, and VHA is doing what it can. But I'll also say that the collaboration that we're going to need, very close collaboration with VBA in the preparation, but also the execution, is extremely, extremely important. So first of all, the law requires us to screen, start screening folks within that 90-day period uh, after it goes into effect for toxic exposures. Right? So that's going to be something our doctors and clinicians have to do at the point of care. And it's a requirement by law, so we have to execute it. And the way we're going to approach that is basically through clinical alerts. Now, this is not going to be perfect in the beginning, uh, but I can tell you so much planning, again, well before I got here, has been in place to try to get that going so that veterans are being asked the question proactively. We're not going to wait for your members to call us and say, I had this exposure, I might be eligible for benefits. We should be getting that from you when you enter our clinics and hospitals. That was congressional intent. That's the president's intent. We're going to be reaching out and trying to get as many folks in when they're eligible as possible. So that's one way of doing it. The second is this concept um, that uh, we're talking about now of no wrong door, right? So nothing's more demoralizing when you call someone for service and say, no, that's the wrong part of the organization. Click, right? You know, that should never happen, especially while we're, again, about to do something incredible for hundreds of thousands of veterans, newly eligible, but folks who already come into our walls who are now going to increase their reliance on us for care. And so that has everything to do with the mechanics of things like phone trees, when folks call the number they know to get VA, and they're curious about this, is there an easy way for them to route up to um, you know, the uh, benefits organization folks to understand what they're eligible for. Uh, all of that is being built in right now to the different ways that we interact with veterans. And the Veteran Experience Office is really helping with that too because, again, they, they really do nothing but try to understand what the experience of veterans are at the end of the chain with what we're doing. So that's another thing that we're trying to do. Importantly, we're also, we also need to make sure that as we continue to try to improve access and as we continue to try to get more appointments available, more services available to the vets that we already have, there's going to be a lot more vets who need us after this legislation. And so I have to do everything I can with our data modelers, uh, the modelers in Mr. Jacobs' organization, DOD, other parts of the government that have all the data that we might need for where these vets are and their likelihood of calling us to get service, that we give all that information we can to our medical center directors and clinic directors on the ground so that they can start planning for what's needed into the future. Who do I need to hire? What services do I need to build? What community partners do we need to engage now to say, hey, we're going to get these folks with these conditions coming in. What do they need? So all of that planning is happening, and we're going to have to implement very soon. So, you know, again, oversight on this and uh, my focus on this will really be important. Thank you. Well, we certainly hope that you'll continue the tradition of um, being a good partner with uh, DAV and the other veteran service organizations and making sure that we're informed um, right up front so that we can share that information um, through our different pathways. You know, we have a DAV magazine that reaches over a million, you know, plus veterans. Um, social media channels and all other ways and we want to make sure we help get the word out and pass the message along um, so veterans know what they're eligible for and how they can access their benefits. Um, under Secretary Quinn, um, although the PACT Act doesn't have, you know, it's such a direct impact on NCA, nonetheless it will increase the number of veterans eligible for burial benefits. Um, has NCA considered what the impact of the uh, PACT Act will have on its operations in your workload? And do you foresee a need for any additional resources or legislative authorities that um, might be necessary? Yeah, I, uh, Joy, great question again. And, and I'll tell you, we have been a part of that entire planning process within VA as we've looked at uh, the, the PACT Act coming on board and, and final passage. Um, frankly, as we look at it, uh, it's very clear that the, the heft of the work will be within VHA and VBA. 
Uh, truly, our hope would be that our workload goes down due to uh, our veterans who have been exposed to toxins and, and burn pits actually are getting the care that they should get. So we'll continue to watch this. Uh, more eligible veterans certainly um, will play out over time for NCA. We'll plan for that and we'll watch uh, uh, Jim's previous question about the wait times for internment services. But uh, again, I think uh, the two gentlemen on my left and right are the ones who will be carrying the load for VA on the PACT Act passage. Great. Um, I know you mentioned in your opening comments that NCA has established the goal of providing 95% of uh, veterans with access um, a burial option within the 75 miles of their home. And I know you talked a little bit about, you know, where you are on that, um, but I just want to reemphasize, you know, for those really rural and remote areas, what are the challenges that you have um, doing that and what are, what are your, um, you know, initiatives that you might have in place? Yeah, I'll, so I'll tell you, you know, 93.7%, uh, that last 6% will be a, a, a that be the tough mile to get because of, of rural areas. But um, here last week, I was up in Alaska, we opened a tribal veteran uh, cemetery, uh, Metlakatla Cemetery up there that, that will provide access to uh, tribal veterans in that area. Um, previously in Oklahoma, where Oklahoma opened their first state grant cemetery, uh, that'll give uh, great access to uh, veterans in the Oklahoma area that, that are in that region. So we continue to work with our partners both at the tribal uh, and city um, state area as well as territories uh, through our grant program. And, and the grant program, we will provide the grant for them to construct the cemetery. They are responsible for the O&M. But that's how we're gonna reach the bulk of our veterans. We've got two programs within NCA, both our urban initiative and our rural initiative. Uh, rural initiative is, is ongoing and it will be um, establishing of national cemeteries in states in which there is not currently a national cemetery. The urban initiative is to provide a columbarium option where uh, land is tough to get. It'd be very difficult to do a national cemetery with, with full um, casketed burial options. But our urban initiative is to provide a columbarium in an area where veterans uh, have maybe a closed cemetery. Here a couple of weeks back, I was in Indianapolis uh, and a cemetery that we had closed uh, 63 years ago. We were able to work with uh, 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 the local cemetery there uh, where we have a veteran cemetery as well and opened a columbarium only option there. And so that gave veterans of the Indianapolis area again a burial option uh, for those who are uh, willing to do the columbarium option. So all of those programs are how we will continue to provide that access to our veterans, but I can't stress enough how important the partnership with the states and with the tribal governments will be uh, to reach those areas where the federal government is just not able to reach uh, specifically. And so we'll continue to work for those options with states, uh, tribes, and, and territories out there to, to reach all veterans and again, get to that cemetery within 75 miles uh, for a national shrine that the veteran deserves. Thank you. Jim? Thanks, Joy. Acting Under Secretary Jacobs, we talked about the backlog, and mm -hmm. it's great that you, it's below 170 for the first time in two years, I believe yep. it was. Uh, does VBA anticipate increasing overtime or contracting out any part of the claims process to help bring down that backlog? Yeah, we're currently, we've taken a pause in mandatory overtime for a couple of months. But we are expecting to resume that very soon here, uh, I believe at the end of the month, uh, beginning of September. I think mandatory overtime is, has certainly been essential uh, in our ability to, to uh, tackle uh, the, the, the inventory. And I think uh, what you've seen is a significant increase in uh, the number of claims decided, uh, but we're, we keep getting more and more claims, which is a good thing. Uh, and so we want to encourage that. I do anticipate, you know, uh, mandatory overtime resuming. But it, I think again, it gets back to a lot of the people process technology. We need, the, we need more overtime. We need uh, to hire more people. We need to optimize the process so that we uh, eliminate uh, uh, inefficiencies uh, that are unnecessary. 
uh, to reduce the time, and then we need the uh, benefit of automation so that we can, can do so as well. I do want to talk about automation, but yep. before that, I mean, when should veterans expect to see significant progress in reducing the time it takes to process their claims? And, I, and just for the audience, a backlog claim is a claim that's been pending for over 125 days. That's how that's characterized. So just want, curious if you have any thoughts on you know, when veterans should expect to see some increases. And I know that's a tough question, especially yeah. with the PACT Act, and we, we realize there's going to be an influx of claims coming in. Yeah. What I would say is the average days pending for a claim are right around that 125 number, but what you'll see is the average days to complete are a little bit longer. And with the number of potential claims that we're anticipating coming as a result of, of the, the PACT Act, I anticipate the inventory and the backlog will increase. And I think what we're doing is we're, we've got our, uh, our foot on, on the gas trying to get ready. So. Uh, you know, between now and January, we're writing all the regulations, we're working more on uh, the additional conditions to include through automation, we're changing the internal processes, the IT system changes, uh, the flashes, so that our staff are ready on January 1 to start processing claims associated with the PACT Act. But I think one of the, the challenges we're gonna face is getting to the point of communication is we will likely see uh, challenges with timeliness because of the, just the sheer size of the volume. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna work to uh, prioritize the claims that are kind of most timely. So based on you know, whether you know, you've got uh, claims from someone who's homeless, someone who's experiencing financial hardship, someone you know, who's over 85, you know, the, uh, a, a variety of different categories. And so uh, the, the, the timeline is still, we're working through the calculations, but I think it's probably gonna take uh, several years for us to try to get back to normal once we expect all of these claims coming in. And, and again, we, we haven't talked about hypertension, but you know, <laughs> hypertension, uh, we're expecting quite a few claims. And so as we look at the timeline associated with implementation for the PACT Act, there are some process implications for, for following that timeline. And so we're working internally to try to figure out how we can, how we can explore uh, the, the, the potential uh, to optimize how we get claims as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, that's great news. I mean, and, and we're a big supporter of submitting electronic claims, yep. and we want to be able to do those as quickly as possible and get them to you as quickly as yep. possible, um, and with all the, all the accurate information as well. In regards to automation, can you tell us a little bit about what that means, what automation really is that, that Rob Reynolds is working on, and how much of an impact do you anticipate that helping with the claims process? Yeah, so big thanks to Rob here who's been doing just uh, an incredible job. What we're, we're looking at doing is figuring out how to take the information we have, pull it into the system so that it makes it easy for the, the raider to then have everything he or she needs to make a decision. <laughs> so rather than going through all of the files and, and, and trying, to, uh, trying to find uh, the sufficient evidence uh, and the records that they need, it's, pulling, it's extracting all of that. So we pull it in from, uh, from the, the claims input, from the DBQ, from other sources, and then we have it very simply and concisely uh, available so that you can then go and just say, do you meet all the requirements? Yes, okay, we're gonna grant it. If not, what we then do is we don't deny it, is we move it to a secondary review so that there's an ability to, to take a closer look and make sure we're not missing something. And so we're still in the early stages. I'm optimistic about the potential, but I'm also pessimistic in that I wanna see it proven before we start telling you uh, how, what the impact is. I will tell you that uh, were it not for the progress we made with VBMS and moving from an entirely paper-based system to an electronic one, we would not have been able to manage uh, through the last two years of the pandemic. And I anticipate as Rob and his team continue to get more conditions in uh, through the automation development process, we're gonna see similar benefits, both those that we're anticipating in terms of lift and the, the total number of claims we can produce and the time in which to do that, but I, I would say probably some additional benefits that we're not anticipating as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people assume that when we talk about automation, the decisions can be made by a computer and no one's looking at it. And so no. it's, it's great for everyone to understand that there will always be a person reviewing that decision, yep. uh, especially when it's a denied decision. Someone Correct. has to physically look at it to make sure it is accurate in yep. accordance with the law. 
The, yeah, the, the other thing I would add is that sometimes when you talk about automation, pe people who are working in that field think that means their job is going away, and nothing could be further from the truth. We need more people. I mean, the number of potential claims we're estimating from the PACT Act alone is going to, it's going to keep us very, very busy for a very long time. And people are excited about that, but we want to make sure we can do more for more people. And so this is one way that we're uh, attempting to do so. So talking more about IT modernization, mm -hmm. when we talk about automation, uh, it's obviously a key element of managing uh, the significant workload VBA has yep. and preventing future backlogs. Um, what are VBA's plans for sunsetting and replacing older IT systems such as VBMS and SCP, and does VBA have sufficient resources to moder modernize its critical IT systems? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you, we have a fantastic CIO in Kurt Del Bene. Kurt came to us from uh, Microsoft, where he was a, a senior leader there, and I actually met him uh, back in 2015, I believe. Uh, he had left Microsoft uh, at the time to go help save healthcare.gov, and I was uh, working as a senior advisor in the office of the secretary and went up with uh, then Under Secretary for Benefits, Allison Hickey, because we were working to launch BBMS at the time, and we were dealing with a number of outages. And so we had a team go up uh, with us, and we met with Kurt, who was uh, architecting uh, the, save, uh, the saving of healthcare.gov to talk about how he approached saving and dealing with the operational issues of that IT system, and then applying it to VBMS. And so he is now uh, in VA and helping us think through what does the future of VBMS look like, as well as our other IT systems, so we can rationalize um, the investments uh, to optimize outcomes for veterans. So that there is an ongoing review, um, and uh, I don't have an exact date of when that will be done, but what I can tell you is we're taking a hard look at what the system should look like and, and what the next phase of it will be. I know one of the big enhancements that was made recently to BBMS was the BBMS notification queue, uh, which essentially provides copies of notifications to the representatives mm -hmm. uh, electronically, you know, right away. Uh, so that's been a significant enhancement, so I want to thank you yep. for that. Um, it's been a big help to our national service officers to be able yep. to have that information electronically because it was a paper-based system, yep. essentially. So now we have it electronic. It's, it's been fantastic, so thank you for that. Absolutely. And, and my hope is that as we're continuing to look at this next phase, that it, you're a partner with us as we, as we consider what changes are, are warranted. Um, because at the end of the day, we need to optimize the process so it works for the people who use it, and that ultimately it increases productivity and it increases quality. Well, we'd love to hear about more collaboration. As you know, we talked about yep. that earlier today. The more we can collaborate, the more we can do together, and the, and the better we're all going to be able to serve veterans and their families and survivors. So thank you. You got it. Under Secretary Quinn, um, I'm sure you agree with that, that modern, updated IT systems are equally important for NCA. Uh, does NCA have any major IT modernization projects underway, and will there be a need for additional resources to fund those? Yeah, I, it's something I'm looking hard at. And, and I'll tell you, I look at uh, what VBA is able to do with automated claims, and, and frankly, we're not there yet within NCA. I, I, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we should probably talk about is uh, we have a process for pre-need eligibility. So for veterans out there who are looking to make a determination, or family members, whether that veteran is eligible for internment at a national cemetery, uh, we have a pre-need application. I know there's forms out on the table out here at, at the NCA desk. But that process is a slow process. I, I, I uh, submitted my uh, file here uh, the, other, the other month and uh, submitted my DD-214s, which I had on hand. And three months later, I got a note back from NCA that said, congratulations, you are eligible for internment at a national cemetery. And, and I just, that's too long. Uh, there should be an automated method. If VBA can make a determination on, on a claim eligibility uh, within days, NCA should not take three months to, to make a determination. So we're going to change that process a little bit. We're going to look at how we can uh, uh, automate that process, I think hand-in-hand hand with VBA, uh, because there are uh, benefits that individuals may put in for that uh, mirror the eligibility for internment in a national cemetery. 
And so I'm in good discussions with BBA on how we can partner up, not have two silos, but have a partnership in which determination for eligibility for interment in a national cemetery. Now, I will say at the same time, uh, that's on the pre-need basis, but on the uh, time of need basis, when a family or a funeral home calls our call center, uh, they will put that uh, effort at the front to ensure that we have a determination on eligibility instantaneously, near instantaneously, so that that family knows and that funeral home knows that veteran is eligible. But, but the, the pre-need is where I think we really need to work. Scheduling. I think we should do a better job scheduling. VHA does a good job scheduling, I think. And um, we need to, to be as easy to schedule an internment service at one of our national cemeteries as well. Uh, so there are those things that I'm looking hard at. I'm bringing on a senior advisor to help me work through the process, work through the business process that we currently use um, do we need to collect the same forms that BBA has already maybe collected? And, and we're going to get through that. And, and we're going to make it easier for veterans, one, to know that they're eligible, uh, and two, for family members to know that that is an option, doesn't obligate them to be interred in National Cemetery, but that the option is there. So I think there are things absolutely that NCA needs to be doing, and we're getting after it. We're getting after it with the help of BBA and my friends over at BHA. All right. Outstanding. And if you ever need any help from DAV with support for Congress for additional funding or anything, you cool. please let us know. Yeah, Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks, Jim. Joy? Dr. Alan Hall, the uh, modernization of the electronic health record um, system is central to the future of VA healthcare. I'm sure you, you know that. Um, but the ongoing rollout of the Oracle Cerner EH EHR system has had some problems. Um, documented by both GAO and the VA's Office of the Inspector General. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to perhaps talk to our membership a little bit about that, um, what was in those reports, what VA is going to be doing, VHA, to make you know sure safety remains the number one priority um, as that system rolls out. Well, Joy, I like how you posed the question, uh, both from the standpoint of the need to modernize our electronic health record because there is a need. That example I brought up earlier where, you know, your veterans are calling to get an appointment, trying to find out where they can go for the quickest and best one, and then having to bring up four or five medical record scheduling systems to do that has everything to do with the fact that even though our current one, this the CPRS, which is still in most places, clinicians love it, it's designed for them. Um, and it's a system that they're used to. Uh, a lot of reasons that it's just not sustainable into the future. And so the decision to modernize the EHR is, is absolutely necessary. And so the question is, what's happening with this decision and how are we executing it? Um, you also framed it well from the standpoint of safety. What is inexcusable, absolutely inexcusable, is if the electronic health record and the way it's deployed leads ultimately to veteran harm. And we've seen an inspector general report with a list. Thankfully, most of these cases were minor harmed and missed things, but there were a couple of cases where the electronic health record was a component of something that should not have happened to a veteran. The moves that Dr. Terry Adiram has made, the deputy secretary and the secretary, on delaying the rollout in certain medical centers across the country has everything to do with the safety story. We have to make sure that our clinicians are not pressured and are not facing a system that ultimately makes their care unsafe. And so you will not find a bigger advocate for our frontline folks who use this system than me, because I know what it's like to go through an electronic health record rollout as a clinician, as a doctor, and as somebody who's tried to make changes to these types of system, uh, systems as a healthcare, healthcare leader. Um, and so what are we gonna do to address the safety risk? Well, number one, we're making sure that we are plussing up the number of folks at the point of care, where your veterans are, to come to the assistance of people who are trying to use that system when they're making care decisions, putting in orders, and making sure those medical orders get to the right place so that your veteran gets the lab, your imaging study, that next appointment, right? So 
making sure that support system is important. Another word for that is change management. You don't just expect people to take on a completely different way of working um, and expect everything will go right. No, you have to support folks, especially on the front line, through that process. The second thing we're trying to do uh, is make sure that the avenues for those folks to raise awareness about the problems that they're facing are maximized. Who can they call? How quickly will they get a response? These are the things that I have to be obsessed with as VHA is the customer of this effort on behalf of veterans. Uh, we need to make sure they have every avenue of raising those issues up to the top levels if needed so that we can call Cerner and say, this is not working right. You need to change this now. I will tell you, holding uh, Oracle Cerner accountable for making sure that the system does not go down as often as it is, and it still is going down um, to a certain level of frequency to the frustration of a lot of us, is gonna be huge on this. And uh, we will take every legal avenue that we can to make sure the basic blocking and tackling of this system, li literally just staying on for our clinicians, that that improves over time. And I will be the loudest voice in the room if I need to if that basic downtime issue is not fixed. But more importantly, we need to also make sure that we are doing everything we can to prepare before that next deployment happens. I joined Dr. Adiram, again, the leader of the initiative, with uh, Network 10 uh, serving the upper Midwest. Um, you had leaders from across that network to say, listen, we are here for you, we're working as a team, and we are a resource to make sure this goes well. And we will do everything we can to make sure that you are ready before you start. And I think if you look back with Man Grand Staff in Spokane, um, the selection of that particular medical center and preparation uh, of that medical center was not where it needed to be before they had that new system deployed. And so <laughs> the point is that we are learning over time with each of these deployments. And where we, you all need to hold us accountable is if the, the next deployments don't go as well, and your veterans, most importantly, feel that. Your veterans should never, ever feel the impact of electronic health record change. That just, just should not happen. We need to make sure that our systems and our people are supported and trained so that the care that your veterans are getting is not impacted. And that's my commitment to try my hardest to do that in concert with that electronic health record team. We're glad to hear that because this issue has been ongoing for decades as far as, you know, this, we know that a modernization needs to occur. There's been failures over time. A lot of money has been provided by Congress. Um, they want to do the oversight. People are getting frustrated. And, you know, again, the last thing that we want to happen is um, for our veterans not to be safe. So we appreciate your commitment to, to that, and we, were, we will certainly be holding you accountable and saying, you know, we want to make sure that that, that um, you said, like you said, that harm does not come to any veteran as a result of the, the modernization effort, but we appreciate that. And I see we're just about out of time here, um, you know, but I wanted to give each of you a chance to make some final comments as we close. And, um, just be able to talk a little bit about, you know, again, anything that you, maybe we haven't covered this afternoon, we could go on for, for hours. I know we have lots of questions, but um, giving you that chance. So I think um, first we'll do uh, maybe Undersecretary Quinn. You have a few comments. Uh, well, listen, <clears throat> it's been uh, a, a good discussion, I think. I, I, I just wanna remind uh, each of you that have stuck with us here, um, I am you, and I am you uh, working within uh, the VA. I came from the field, uh, not having worked uh, for federal government in the past other than my military service, uh, and I can assure each of you that uh, from Secretary McDonough to Deputy Secretary Remy to uh, my partners here on stage with me, I can't remember serving in an organization to include the U.S. Army and Army National Guard that is more dedicated and know the customers that they serve. You really do have the right team in the right place 
uh, doing the right thing for veterans uh, within uh, the VA. I get my health care through VHA. I get my benefits and have total confidence through VBA. Now, I've not used NCA yet, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I have confidence in what they will do. I got to tell you, uh, NCA, uh, and there is a survey that comes out every three years. We just did it again this year. The results are pending. But NCA is number one for customer satisfaction in the United States, both private entities, private corporations, as well as federal government. Your NCA within the VA is the number one for customer satisfaction. Our employees out across our 155 national cemeteries understand their mission is a non-fail mission. Their mission is to provide those final honors to that veteran who has served our nation honorably, or to that family member who has sacrificed so that their veteran can serve. Again, our goal is to get a national cemetery or a state tribal territorial grant cemetery to within 75 miles of every veteran out there. We're close, but we got a ways to go. And it's partners like great state of Florida, Hammer Hartzell, who's sitting here in the front row, that we're going to get that done. And we'll continue to strive to get a cemetery, a national shrine, within 75 miles of every veteran. So again, I am you. I am you working within the VA. And a partnership with DAV is how we will continue to best serve our veterans. So again, thanks for your time today. And, and uh, appreciate the questions. Acting Under Secretary Jacobs, any final thoughts for VBA? Um, thanks very much, Jim and, and Joy, and, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I guess what I would say is we have a, a once-in-a-generation opportunity to uh, increase our support uh, for veterans and their family members. Uh, it's going to be a lot of hard work, and what I would say to each one of you is what I would say, what I said uh, to all of the VBA employees uh, my first week, which is I operate uh, under three core principles. One is uh, full transparency, so telling you what's happening, uh, with a priority on collaboration, on working together, and third, doing everything with the veteran at the center. And so as we move forward with implementation of the PACT Act and fulfill our mission uh, across the organization, uh, I look forward to doing all three of those with you, uh, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more to come. Um, it's going to be uh, a really momentous opportunity, and uh, the opportunity is, is really uh, limitless. So thank you very much for a, a really productive conversation, for including us, and uh, look forward to uh, many more. Thank you. thank you. And Dr. Ellen Hall, I'll ask you to go last, but I also um, ask, just as a point of privilege, um, we talked a little bit behind, uh, before we came on just about women veterans and your vision for women veterans, and didn't get a chance to ask a question about that, but I know um, you have some thoughts about that, and I think our women, we have a lot of women veterans in the audience today, and um, sharing how you can make sure that um, they feel comfortable and welcomed at our VAs and that they know the, you know, for all veterans um, can count on VA to serve them to the best of your ability. If you all have a few comments, thanks. Thank you, Joy, and um, that is an extremely important priority in addition to other things that we didn't get to talk about today uh, on this panel, um, equity more generally, uh, giving as much as we can in terms of inclusivity of the care that we provide to veterans of all stripes across the country, mental health and suicide prevention, the among the most important clinical priorities in addition to the care that we give to disabled vets in our spinal cord injury centers and so many other services that all of uh, your members and your veterans depend on. Um, and also just working with folks who know veterans better than anybody else. What I'd like to say is that the competitive advantage that VA has compared to the rest of healthcare is number one, knowledge and trust of the veteran. There isn't a single healthcare system that has the trust scores that VA does for its customers, but also the scope and the scale and the size of our incredible organization. A shout out to our incredible 
clinical employees and VHA employees across the country who do this work for all of you every day. Without them, there's nothing I could do to be a partner with you in helping them. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I think this will be the honor of my professional life uh, in this role. Uh, I was asked by folks who interviewed me for this job, including somebody in this room who will remain nameless, who will you work for if you are selected? Uh, and my answer was veterans. That's my primary boss. And my only request to you uh, is, as Josh said and others, uh, and Under Secretary Quinn and others on this panel, uh, let me know if we're not doing that, what we need to do to serve your members, to serve your veterans. We can't do this without you. I can't do this without you. Um, and I hope that this was an opportunity uh, for me to introduce myself to you, but also commit that we will be very close partners uh, in doing everything we can for veterans. Thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of Jim, myself, and all of us here at DAV, we want to thank our three guests um, this afternoon for joining us. And we really look forward to um, continuing to work with you to strengthen the health care benefits, NCA, um, for all veterans, their families, and survivors. So we really appreciate you taking the time, um, spending it here today with, with uh, DAV members. And let's give them a great round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.